Hello, friends. So I'll be talking on this uh, very basic topic, diabetic ketoacidosis. So if you recall, I had spoken on uh, hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic state uh, in the previous video. So this was a question asked in uh, DRNB. Uh, so it's important. And many a times, this scenario is given in OSCEs and even in a case scenario in IDCC and so on and so forth. So it's important you understand the basic key nets about that DKA and this is something very innate to anyone who's treating patients in ICU. So I wish to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr. Ashekar, who helped me develop this content. So like in uh, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, the definition has different components as DKA, the name itself sounds, they should have high sugar, they should have acidosis and they should have ketone body feature positive. So, Insulin will be absolute insulin levels and relative would be low in these patients. So they'll have high blood sugar levels and they'll have dehydration. So these are different components embedded within the definition in these patients. And they will have acidosis with ketone bodies present. So these are the components of uh, what happens in DKA. And when this happens, there is derangement of the intermediary metabolites and there is increased production of acetone, acetoacetic acid and beta hydroxybutyrate, which contributes to the acidemia that develops in these patients. So the DKA manifests in both type 1. It's not only in type 1 diabetes that you see DKA, you see in both type 1 and type 2. And in type 1 diabetics, the initial manifestation or presentation when you diagnose diabetes may be with DKA. So 25% present with DKA and that's when they get diagnosed with having diabetes in younger population. So pathophysiology, this is very important. So I'll just put it in a pictorial format uh, for you all to depict when this is asked in a DRNB exam. It is important you just put it in a pictorial format to make things easy. So there is insulin deficiency or absent insulin and this leads to production of glycerol from the fat cells. So the fat cells produce in this glycerol which is converted to glucose in the liver. So basically in the whole pathophysiology you'll see there are different constituents which are getting converted to glucose due to lack of insulin. So the fat cells get broken to fatty acids which again get converted to ketones within the liver. And the muscle, there is a muscle uh, sort of a breakdown which produces amino acids and substrates so which leads to transport of this glycogen chain and this glycogen chain gets converted into glucose within the liver so basically the crux of this is there are different constituents which are getting converted to glucose in the liver like fatty acids converting to ketones glycerol converting to glucose and then you have this breakdown products of the muscle which is amino acid which convert basically glycogen chain is converted to glucose and there is increase in the glucagon and which also gets converted into ketones and the insufficient insulin or absent insulin by per se produce increased ketones and there is increased glucose production. So all in all, there are three basic things that happen which leads to increase in the glucose. So you would have heard this from your MBBS days. There is glycogenolysis. Then there is gluconeogenesis. So glycogen is getting broken down and converting into glucose. Then there is glucose, excess production of glucose, gluconeogenesis, and there is ketogenesis. So these three form the quintessence of what really happens in uh, diabetic keto. So maybe an exam, if you just put in a figurative format, with fat cells getting broken, converting to ketones, glycerol converting to glucose, and this glycogen chain getting converted to glucose, and increased glucagon, which produces uh, ketones, which is converted to ketones. So this makes things easy for even examiners to appreciate that you have understood the concept well. So again, in DK, there is low insulin, leads to hyperglycemia. And because there is increased glucose, there is glucosuria. Because there is increased glucose, there is osmotic diuresis and then dehydration happens. And because of this excess counter-regulatory hormones, there is increased ketogenesis. Because there is excess ketone bodies, it contributes to acidosis that is present. So excess counter-regulatory hormones for all the stress hormones. So glucagon levels are high, cortisol levels are high, catecholamines and growth hormones. So these are all the stress hormones which are high. And because of these counter-regulatory hormones which get increased, there is increased ketone body production and acidosis. So this is in essence about the pathophysiology of DKA. So what is the burden of DKA? So this is US data. There are around 160,000 admissions per year with DKA 
in the hospitals, the cost is touted to be $1 billion per year. This is all US data. I'm sure in India, it may be similar or even more. And 65% of the DKAs are less than 19 years. And it is shown that DKA is the main cause of death in 85% of uh, children less than 19 years. So which is an enorm enormous burden and one needs to have due knowledge and uh, skills to manage these patients. And 69% of the patients with DKA can present with uh, cerebral edema, so which, which is also a cause of concern. So they can be obtended, confused, so on and so forth. So, so in the exam, obviously, when we ask DKA, it's good to put this triad. So that the triad of DKA is they have a high glucose, more than 200 milligram per deciliter, and they have ketone bodies, and they have acidosis. This typically forms the triad of DKA. So they have classified DKA as mild, moderate, and severe. So we call it as mild DKA if the venous pH is less than 7.3 and bicarbonate. It's easy to remember. pH 7.3, 7.2, 7.1. 7.2 is moderate, 7.1 is severe. Bicarb 15, 10, and 5. So very easy to remember. So moderate is where you have venous pH is less than 7.2. Bicarbonate is less than 10. Severe is where we, venous pH is less than 7.1 and bicarb less than 5. So very easy to remember. So obviously in this in this year they had asked this question. So it's good to write these components. So the risk factor for DKA is age less than 12 years, lower socioeconomic status. And if someone is on concomitant drugs like glucocorticoids, we know that glucocorticoids increase the sugar levels, antipsychotics or disoxide or HTLT2 inhibitors. So what SGLT2 inhibitors does is, uh, when there are stress hormones, so the release of insulin obviously we expect it to increase. So this the production of insulin in the presence of stress hormones is blunted by SGLT2 inhibitor. And that is touted as one of the risk factors when someone is on SGLT, that they are at increased risk of developing DKA. And and where and it is it uh, the risk increases in someone who has no access to the healthcare facilities. So these are some of the risk factors uh, in patients who tend to develop DKA. So now the question is, why do ketones develop? So the ketones typically happens when someone is a diabetic and non-compliant and someone is not having timely food or is fasting or there is no carbohydrate diet or someone who has diarrhea and someone who is excessively doing exercise without proper diet in patients with DKA. Or it can happen at the onset of diabetes or when there is an interruption in the administration of insulin. So these are all some of the triggers as what can push someone into DKA. And there can be conditions where there is increased resistance to the insulin that they are taking. And that happens, most of the listeners would know that DKA is concomitantly present in ICU with an underlying infection, sepsis, or it can be myocardial. So there are various triggers which may be one of the triggers for inducing or causing DKA. And the conditions where the insulin, there is increased resistance to insulin, where insulin is not acting effectively in the presence of infection or post-surgical patients where the stress levels increases, your stress hormones are high, that your counter-regulatory hormones have increased, there is increase in insulin resistance and increased ketone body production. So that is the typical conundrum. Or someone with sepsis, or someone with increased alcohol consumption, salicylate poisoning, or inborn metabolic error. So these are some of the conditions which uh, sort of act as triggers or which perpetuate the occurrence of DKA because of the intrinsic insulin resistance that develops because of these conditions. I'm sure many of you would know that someone comes to DKA, we actively look for any infection that may be present. And this may happen in the setting of post-surgical or sepsis or someone who is an alcohol dependent. We do see more commonly in such group of patients. So what are the triggers of DKA? The triggers of DKA are pretty much similar to hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, which I had shown. So infection becomes an important trigger. 40 to 60% of the time, there can be a concomitant infection. It can be pneumonia. And predominantly, LRTIs and pneumonia is shown to be one of the triggers. Underlying sepsis, 16%, it is due to UTI. And most common trigger is non-adherence to the drugs, the insulin that they may be taking. And uh, and this very figuratively had shown, even for HHS, the same risk factor remains. Someone with a stroke, someone with a traumatic brain injury, seizure, someone with myocardial infection, GI bleed, 
post surgical alcohol venous thromboembolism pancreatitis aki so all these are the triggers for inducing someone with diabetes to develop dka and and these may be triggers more so in type 2 diabetes because type 1 will be much younger patients so type 2 uh, diabetes can be little elderly people where they can have all these risks so it could be post surgical it could be gi bleed it could be pancreatitis they could have concomitant uh, acute kidney injury or they can have ischemic heart disease and mi and the drugs that can perpetuate or act as a trigger or uh, or psychiatric drugs which i did mention and someone who is on steroids beta blockers diuretics and chemotherapy drugs so these are some of the drugs which can act as a trigger for inducing dka so what are the symptoms of dka uh, or hyperglycemic we did speak so poly polydipsia so they have increased thirst so they'll drink a lot of water so they could have nausea and vomiting they can have blurring of vision you know they can have confusion obtundation so there's increased fatigability and most of you would have characteristically read that they would have abdominal pain which is not the case in hhs and they would have polyuria they can have tachycardia because of lot loss of lot of water so they can develop they can become hypovolemic and hypotension so so these are very traditionally spoken about as the symptoms of uh, dka and very often in icu we see them coming with tachycardia definitely they have this sweet order acetone order order in uh, when you go near them and uh, they can come with hypotension we see this in icu abdominal pain some of them do have and confusion obtundation is more common in uh, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state and less in dka but these are sort of a gen generic symptoms that you can expect so lab values in dka and hhs so obviously when this question is asked in an exam it is good to showcase your knowledge about uh, how do you differentiate dka and hhs so in dka the glucose levels is not as high as in hhs because in hhs the sugar levels can be anywhere in the range of 600 to 1000 mg per deciliter but in dka it will be little less 250 to 600 and as the name suggests dka there will be ph will be acidemic so it will be 6.8 to 7.3 but in hhs there won't be acidosis component so ph will be more than 7.3 dka patients will be very tachypneic uh, so your pco2 may be low because of severe acidosis that is present they'll be compensated with increase in the respiratory rate co2 will be low which is not the case in hhs and as i said bicarb will be less than 18 in dka and not so in hhs anion gap will be increased in dka because there are ketones which are contributing to the anion gap so anion gap will be high but in hhs it will be normal or slightly increased osmolality will be high but not as high as in hhs as you see in hhs it will, osmolality is much higher and uh, the key differentiating factor is the serum ketones or urine ketones which are grossly positive in dka and which 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 is not the case in hhs and what about the lab value serum sodium is low in dka in hhs it can be high or normal and potassium can be normal to high in dka initially when dka comes potassium appears high but later on as you start insulin it starts coming down in hhs potassium can be normal magnesium is normal in both phosphate is normal but but after correction while you are correcting all these start coming down potassium starts coming down magnesium starts coming down phosphate starts coming down and replenishment of these has to be done creatinine can be mildly increased in dka and hhs generally they have more established acute kidney injury so for all the trainees i'm sure you're all well versed so we ask in it's expected to know the correction of sodium for the high, for the rise in the blood sugar level for every 100 increase in the blood sugar level so there will be uh, sodium serum sodium would have reduced by 1.6 millikolens so you have to add 1.6 millikolens to compensate for that otherwise it is a pseudo hyponatremia that you will see so for every 100 increase you should add 1.6 millikolens to the lab sodium that will be shown to correct for that sodium so that is something which we which every trainee is expected to know so that main treatment like in hhs the main stay of treatment for dka as i said there will be high sugar there will be acidosis there will be ketone and there will be dehydration so fluid remains the main stay so the choice of fluid is either saline or you can use balanced solution of springer lactate so the initial resuscitation is 2 to 3 liters in 1 to 3 hours or 10 to 20 ml per kg per hour so if you have a 60 kg individual you have to give fluid at 1 to 1.2 liters per hour 
for first three hours or three to four hours, and it should not exceed more than fifty ml per kg per hour in four hours. So that is what is said because of the brain edema or the change in the uh, solutes that happen in the brain, which can cause problem. And after you have initially resuscitated with maybe two to three liters or three to four liters, then you can consider starting 0.45% saline at 250 to 500. But if sodium is normal, you can continue your saline or ringer lactate because ringer lactate has little less sodium. So it may be more, we tend to use more of balanced solution after we have used initial saline. And if blood sugar level, slowly you would have started insulin, starts coming down to less than 250. Then it is expected we start 5% dextrose along maybe alternate with half saline or RL at 150 to 250 ml per hour. If serum sodium is normal or high, then it is advisable to go for half saline. If sodium is normal, you can continue with saline or you can continue with balanced solution like Ringer lactate, but keeping an eye on the chloride because saline has a lot of chloride, it can lead to hyperchloremic acidosis. So if serum sodium is less than 135, you can stick on to your saline or your balanced solution like finger lactate. Goal is to replenish the dehydration or the fluid deficit in 24 hours. But as you are correcting blood sugar levels, so as I said, for every 100 increase, so you need to add 1.6. So whilst you are correcting sugar, for every 100 drop in blood sugar, so the serum sodium comes down by 2.4 milligrams. So it comes down more rapidly. 1.6 is what you add per 100 increase. And it, while coming down, the serum sodium reduces by 2.4 milliequivalent. Just This is of academic interest. Is there a role for soda bicarb? Because in HHS, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar, there's no role for soda bicarb. Here, soda bicarbonate would be considered if pH is less than 7 or if the bicarb is very low, less than 5 millimoles, you can administer sodium bicarbonate. So just to show the different constituents of different fluids, as I said, in saline, if you're using excess saline, if the fluid deficit is more, your chlorides will start going up. So keep an eye on the chlorides because these chlorides may contribute to hyperchloremic acidosis and acidosis may not get corrected. That is when it is desirable to change to balanced solution like ringer lactate or any of these because here, as you see, the chloride levels is much lesser than the saline, 111 and 98 in plasma like. And here they have acetate and gluconates as their additional constituents. And obviously, you have resuscitated well with fluids and everything happens concurrently. You start the fluid resuscitation, then you are expected to give insulin. So insulin is always short-acting regular insulin at 0.1 units per kg and you keep increasing. You give as a bolus 0.1 unit per kg. So if suppose it's 60 kg, so you would give 6 to 10 units and then keep increasing by every 2 to 3 fold. You have to keep increasing until you see blood sugar levels falling by 50 to 75 milligram per deciliter. Until we see the sugars coming down, you have to keep cranking up the insulin dose. And as I said, if once the blood sugar level comes to less than 250, you are expected to start 5% dextrose with insulin and start reducing the insulin by 0 0.02 to 0 0.1 units uh, per kg per hour. So as you would have increased, you are expected to start reducing as you see your glucose levels coming down to less than 250. It is important to monitor blood sugar level with the point of care every hour and electrolytes four hourly. And it is extremely important in intensive care, obviously when you are treating decay, you have to keep looking at potassium levels which will drastically start coming down. You have to replenish this potassium once the sugars are coming down and once you have initiated insulin. Even your magnesium level comes down, you have to replenish magnesium. Even phosphate levels come down because all these are pushed into the cells. So you need to replenish all this and keep checking these levels at some frequency. So in our practice, we check blood sugar every hourly and electrolytes to check four hourly in acute stage. Once things are getting better, we reduce the frequency to maybe six hourly or eight hourly and so on and so forth. So this is just a rough algorithm. If you go online, there are a lot of algorithms present. So this is a, just one of the algorithm where if it's more than 500, you start with a ballpark of 20 and start reducing it with the sugars they have. As you see, even here, the 5% dextrose is to be started when sugars come to 250 to 300 and you start increasing this dextrose also up to 150 ml based on the blood sugar level as it starts coming down, you have to start increasing your dextrose as well and start reducing the insulin infusion. 
So there is a caveat which most of you trainees would know that acidosis persists despite you have corrected the fluid deficit and despite having corrected your uh, uh, blood glucose level, acidosis persists. So the reason is the nitroprusside dipstick test that we do mainly checks for acetone. So this we would traditionally ask in exam as to why acidosis persists even after correcting your hydration even after correcting the sugar. Because the dipstick test that you do, which is a nitroprusside test, mainly checks for acetone. And it checks to some extent astroacetic acid, but it does not check for beta-hydroxybutyrate. And this acetone is very slowly eliminated. So this is persistent, it will be persistently be present in the circulation for up to 48 to 36 to 48 hours. That's why you take you see much longer time for the whole acidosis uh, to settle in, uh, despite having corrected your fluid status and despite having gotten the sugar levels down. And once DKA uh, treatment, ha once DKA has resolved, so insulin has to be considered at some baseline insulin at 0.5 to 0.6 units per kg per day. So many of the physician friends would know. Uh, so once we have treated DKA, once acidosis is corrected, your fluid uh, deficit is corrected, sugars are corrected, so we have to put them on regular insulin. So the dose of regular insulin is we look at the cumulative requirement of the insulin that they have, they have needed to get the sugars down and to have corrected this. And we look at two thirds of it. We put it in as a long, long, uh, long acting insulin and one third to half we put it as a short acting insulin. So we take the cumulative dose and we split it. So two thirds we, we give long acting insulin. It can be Lantus, it can be pH Lente or Ultra Lente. And half to one third we put as a short acting insulin. So, so this is for the maintenance. So that is, and how do we go? This is the last slide. How do we prevent DKA? So the key thing is anyone who has come to ICU with DKA, they need to be educated that at any cost, many a times the commonest cause of DKA in younger individuals we see is where they would have skipped insulin dose. So they need to be educated that they cannot at any cost skip the insulin. But in elderly, the DKA is predominantly due to underlying infection and all those triggers I showed you. It may be glucocorticoids, it may be pneumonia, it can be MI, it can be pancreatitis. We see a lot of pancreatitis coming with DKA. That is in elderly. But in young, it will be almost always they would have skipped insulin. And it is important to prevent dehydration and it is important to prevent hypoglycemia. It is important to educate these patients about regular monitoring of their blood sugar levels and regular monitoring of any ketosis that may be present. And they should be educated about supplemental fast-acting insulin. And it is it's important to treat the triggers. And it is important to be in touch with the medical team uh, to address their needs when such complications arise. So that's about DKA. So brief overview. So this can be asked in any exam as a question, as a theory question, or it can be part of our key or it can be part of the station. So it is important to have good clarity on how you approach this decay. It's a simple topic, but it is something which we see very often and we need to have absolute clarity how we approach these patients. So thank you one and all. So you can visit my website www.drpadipanga.com to rehead to this. So thank you one and all.